we were talking about this youthful atheism and uh, why on earth I'd choose a title I had never heard before. Uh, but that goes back to uh, to my son, Joel, who's uh, here on the call with us. And uh, this is his last uh, birthday party. And you can guess his age if you can read backwards on those tiny little candles. But anyway, uh, Joel <laughs> is uh, my son is uh involved in some online gaming communities and also chat uh, communities and uh, in those he has met a lot of post-christian and post-adventist youth wow. and uh i would say if i if i'm relaying it correctly most of these are probably teenagers or early 20s so uh and uh they they yeah. present as atheists, but then as he gets to know them, they have conversations. Uh, uh, they and they find out that he's an Adventist. They start telling their backstory and so on. So um, he has had engagement with many of these, and he says sees them going from Adventist Christian to atheist in a very very short time. And so the question is, you know, what is it that precipitates such a journey? And and Joel has found that there's a common denominator with these, and that is two things. One of them is the picture of God. Uh, they have grown up with a picture of God as vindictive, angry, judgmental, unforgiving, severe, arbitrary, uh, any names you want to call it. In other words, they've come to the place where they say, if there is a God, I don't want to know him. I want to stay as far away from, in fact, my best life would be if there is no God, because if that's what God is like, uh, this would be a pretty sorry uh, life to live. And so uh, they've come because of a picture of God, uh, they have come to reject him, but it's a picture they received in Christian or Adventist context, which is something to ponder. The second is the way they've been treated in a local church two common denominators uh, that Joel has found uh, in, in working with these uh, young people online, uh, how they were treated in church, rejected uh, for whatever reason, whether it's LGBT uh, or the way they dress or the music they like, uh, etc., that the church was not a welcoming place. And this led me to reflect that uh, when you take, I think, a an exegetical view, in other words, letting the text of Revelation actually speak for itself rather than imposing a construct that we bring from outside. Uh, when you let Revelation 12 speak, it actually speaks to both of these issues very powerfully. And so I thought that might be a direction uh, we could profitably uh, go today in the seminar. And uh, if Joel wants to uh expand or correct uh anything i've said about this uh, uh we can let him do that at the end all right so uh adventists have always been deeply engaged in what uh, we've come to call the cosmic conflict another term is the great controversy and many have said this is the unique seventh-day adventist contribution to theology and uh, Revelation 12 is the most important biblical text uh, for that theme of the great controversy. Um, you could say it's the biggest story ever told, a story of a universe at war, a good against evil, a Christ against Satan. So uh, this, is, this big, big story has been central uh, to Adventist thinking, I think, from almost uh, the beginning, at least uh, since the uh, earliest publication of Great Controversy, which would be 1858, I believe. But Adventists are not alone in holding this idea of a cosmic conflict. Uh, you have Origin of Alexandria, an early church father, uh, early third century, uh, wrote a book called uh, Against Celsus. Uh, Kelsus was a pagan philosopher in the second century, so only about 80 years after the book of Revelation was written. And Kelsus is attacking Christianity. He's a pagan philosopher uh, saying, I don't like Christianity. 
And his main issue is, I don't like Christianity's God. He says, it is a God that's way too weak. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? He came to that conclusion because uh, Christians taught that there was a created power of God, Satan, who was powerful enough to, uh, to contest with God. And Kelsus said, a God who would allow rivals is just way too weak for my taste. And Origen responds with a full picture of the cosmic conflict. In other words, he's basically saying, you're right, Kelsus. You're right that that's what we believe. You're wrong that that means that God is weak or that he's not worthy of your respect. Uh, so because of Kelsus and because of Origen's response, we know that the very earliest churches had a pretty comprehensive and healthy view of the cosmic conflict, even though it doesn't feature as much in the Bible as we might like. For, to, to surprise to many people, but uh, uh, some of the most detailed pictures of the cosmic conflict outside of the writings of Ellen White is the Quran. has a lot to say about Satan, a lot to say about uh, the contest between God and Satan has a lot to say about the Garden of Eden and, and the original fall. And uh, Satan is an explicit part of that in the Quran, which is not the case in Genesis. So um, the uh, Quran is a, is a fascinating uh, source of information on the cosmic conflict and how it was looked at in uh, Eastern Christianity and Islam. Uh, then you have Dante in the middle ages uh, who uh, addressed quite a bit of uh, things that uh, would be familiar to most seventh-day adventists uh, perhaps the strongest influence on ellen white was john milton an english poet in the 17th century who wrote paradise lost and uh, many of the themes and language in which adventists talk about cosmic conflict can be found in milton uh, Henry Melville, very interesting character. He was the dean of Westminster Abbey. So he was a very, very prominent Anglican clergyman. And his sermons uh, on cosmic conflict are fascinating. And uh, Ellen White seems to have read those sermons. She was very familiar with Melville as well as Milton. And uh, so these two uh, were conduits. Uh, I doubt she was familiar with Origen, or at least I'm not aware that she is, but she definitely uh, bounces off Milton and Melville. And so, of course, Ellen White, the most comprehensive outline of the cosmic conflict, at least until her day, uh, surprising to many, are these two characters in the mid-20th century. C.S. Lewis, known to pretty much everyone. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, the name might not be so familiar, but Lord of the Rings is certainly uh, one of the most transcendent literary pieces uh, of the 20th century. And it is strongly based also on cosmic conflict approach. And then today, the, outside the Adventist church, uh, Gregory Boyd is a prominent spokesperson within the evangelical world for this great tradition of a cosmic conflict. All right, so let's get into Revelation itself, and uh, let's take a fresh look at the big story of Revelation 12. And uh, I, I think what, what often happens with Adventists is they open the book of Revelation with a big story in mind, and that big story controls what they see in the text and sometimes even overwhelms the text. What I want to do today is just look at the story of Revelation 12 as it unfolds within Revelation 12. Uh, the chapter 12 begins with the birth of Jesus and goes to the final events of Earth's history. So it's a quasi-apocalyptic prophecy. And I say quasi because uh, generally Revelation is seen to be a little bit different than Daniel. Similar, uh, but not exactly the same. Revelation 12 comes close. Uh, to Daniel, perhaps closer than any other part of Revelation in terms of the genre, the style. Uh, there's three key characters introduced. So there's a story in Revelation 12 with three main characters that are introduced in verses 1 to 5. Now, one thing I've discovered is that whenever new characters are introduced, 
in the book of Revelation, it's as if the author of Revelation hits a pause button uh, on, you know, on the, uh, what do you call it, the YouTube video <laughs> that he's viewing. And he hits the pause button and then takes time to do two things. He gives a visual description of this new character. And then he gives a summary of that character's previous history. So uh, a new character appears, you get a visual description, and then something of the backstory for this character. All right, and so the first of these three characters is the woman in chapter 12. And in Revelation 12, one to two, uh, she is introduced. And a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman dressed with the sun. The moon was under her feet and upon her head was a victory crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and she cried out in pain as she labored to give birth. If you're wondering about the translation, that happens to be my own. Uh, there's a couple of turns in there that I would not expect in a traditional translation because I'm trying to bring out some of the nuances of the Greek language uh, in that text. But what you'll notice here is the text is in two parts. Verse one is a visual description. The woman dressed with the sun, moon under her feet, 12 stars on her head. And then is a backstory. She was pregnant and she cried out in pain as she labored to give birth. So you see new character comes up. There's a visual description of the character and then the backstory. All right, second character. Well, before we do that, let me just mention that uh, when Adventists view this woman, they immediately go, she is Old Testament Israel and uh, because she gives birth to Christ. Uh, Roman Catholics uh, immediately see Mary uh, in this. But let's hold that kind of uh, interpretation for the moment and just follow the story that is being given here. So for Adventist the woman's Old Testament, Israel. Now the second character is the dragon. And uh, the dragon was uh, appears in verse three. By the way, if you notice some of the artwork in here, uh, this was done in Australia as a backdrop to a revelation seminar uh, that was published in Australia about 10 years ago. And if any of you are interested in that, it's it's available from Advent Source, and uh, there's videos and you know text and uh, images and and so forth that uh, it hasn't gotten nearly the publicity I I wished it would have gotten, but uh, uh, it is available for anybody who wants to to go in some depths uh, on their own. Anyway, here comes the dragon. Another sign was seen in heaven, a great fiery red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his head, seven crowns. His tail dragged down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth in order that when the child was born, he might eat it up. Once again, you have first a visual description. A dragon, red in color, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns, etc. And then the backstory. When the dragon appears in this vision, uh, he's someone who in the past has dragged down a third of the stars of heaven and thrown them to earth. But now he stands before the woman in order to eat up the child when it's born. So you have here not only two new characters in the story of Revelation, but enough backstory that you're ready for what is about to happen. The dragon in Adventist understanding is usually Satan. I mean, in the text itself, it says in verse nine that it's Satan, but also so you see uh, images of Rome. Uh, under Herod, uh, Rome sought to destroy the baby Jesus as soon as he was born uh, in the, the Matthew story of Bethlehem. So uh, there is a historical connection here uh, to Rome. Third character, it's a male child. And in verse five, it says, she, the woman, gave birth to a son. The vision's moving on. He's a male child who's about to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. 
So verse five, we get into the story more deeply. We've had two backstories, two characters, and now you have what would appear to be the main character, this male child who is born to the woman and who escapes uh, the dragon's attempt to, to eat it up uh, by being snatched up to God's throne. But you may be puzzled over this part. In the previous two introductions, you had a visual description and then you had a backstory. There's no backstory here and there's no visual. You, you never get a sense of what the male child looks at. Instead of a backstory, it talks about his future. He's about to shepherd all nations with a rod of iron. So there's something different here. Why is there no visual? And why is there no history for this particular character? Well, I think the reason is because in the book of Revelation, multiple characters can represent the same person or entity. In other words, there's no special introduction to this male child because he's been in the story before. And he represents, as we could recognize, Jesus, who earlier in the story is the son of man in chapter one and the lamb of chapter five. So Jesus has appeared in the story before and therefore perhaps needs no special introduction here. Similarly, Satan is also called the dragon, the serpent, and other things. Uh, the church can be the woman, and next week we'll talk about the remnant, uh, which is also in this chapter. So um, in the book of Revelation, multiple characters in the story can represent the same entity at different points. And we'll see that, uh, obviously, when we get to verse 9. So here we see the male child, which Adventists would understand to be Jesus, and it mentions his birth and his ascension to heaven. No mention of the cross at this point, uh, no mention of his earthly ministry or his baptism, just the birth and the ascension are mentioned here. So from a traditional perspective, uh, the woman represents Israel, the dragon represents Satan or Rome, and the baby represents the earthly Jesus. But you see right there, you're already moving into history. You're already moving into an outer construct. I'd like to suggest we stay with the story for just for a little while here. Let's see what's going on in chapter 12. Because when you start making references to history, eventually you're comparing history and not comparing text and revelation. The story is an interesting one, and it's a very important one. And if we miss the story, we may miss the purpose of the chapter. We may have a good result, but not the ideal result. So we sometimes jump too quickly to history. The story has three characters here, dragon, woman, male child. So in the story, where does the woman go? You know, you have the male child snatched up to heaven, leaving a dragon and the woman standing there on earth. You know, where does the woman go? Where does the dragon go? What happens after this? It's important to stay with the story uh, if we want to understand. So in verse six, it says, the woman fled into the desert where she has a place prepared for her by God in order that she might be nourished there for a thousand two hundred and 60 days. All right, so the woman takes off into the desert. And that would be interesting to pursue in and of itself. But we don't have time this morning to pursue that part of the story. We'll leave the woman in the desert and come back to the dragon. In verse 7, it says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels gathered to fight against the dragon and the dragon and his angels also fought. So the woman's out in the wilderness, in the desert. She escapes the dragon. The dragon does not pursue her, but instead he ends up in heaven fighting against Michael 
and his angels. So there's movement in the story. As we notice the male child, uh, he ascends up to heaven. The dragon in verse seven follows the male child to heaven. The woman on the other hand, uh, she went out into the desert and the story resumes with her in verse 13, which we will have to handle at some other time. All right, so the story has moved. I think so frequently we see in verses seven and eight, the original war in heaven. And I think there's certainly overtones of that, but we tend to see this as detached from verse five and six, has nothing to do with it. But if you're reading the story as it was written, as the author intended it to be read, the next appearance of the dragon is not chasing the woman in the desert, it's warring in heaven. So you get up to heaven and there is a Michael in heaven who is fighting against the dragon. And the dragon, it says, was not strong enough. Neither was a place found in heaven for them. Well, who's this Michael? New character. Once again, where's the visual description? There is none. Where's the backstory? There is none. So evidently, Michael was in the story before. And it's interesting that the male child in verse five is snatched up to heaven, is never seen again, never mentioned again in the book of Revelation. This is a strong suggestion, I think, that Michael is another name for Jesus, as Adventists have taught uh, through the years. And you put together all the Michael texts in the Bible, I believe there are five of them. And uh, I think the best uh, solution for who Michael is, uh, is in fact, Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting that the Jews outside of the Bible had Michael as an archangel, one of the seven archangels uh, in the Jewish hierarchy. Gabriel uh, was another one. And uh, it's interesting, would uh, Christians, knowing that Michael is both Jesus and an archangel, would they have come to the conclusion that perhaps Jesus was incarnated as an angel before he was incarnated uh, as a human being. Uh, there's there's some suggestion that Ellen White seems to have believed that as well. Just a just a nugget to to think on. All right. So no visual, no history for Michael, because in my view he appeared before as the Son of Man, the Lamb, the male child. So the dragon follows the male child to heaven. The male child uh, becomes Michael in the story, and then battle ensues. If all of this seems just a little bit crazy, uh, watch a few of the Marvel uh, movies, and you'll realize that this type of transformation is uh, is quite common in those apocalyptic, those 21st century apocalyptic stories. And if you're saying, is Revelation going to have meaning in the 21st century? It should, because the 21st century is obsessed with apocalyptic, uh, you know, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, uh, the Avengers, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, this whole cosmic conflict, uh, universal war, it's a very common theme. And uh, people learn their philosophy often watching movies like this. And the Matrix, uh, another one uh, along some of these lines. So uh, what's happening in Revelation is weird in terms of normal, everyday life. But it's not weird in terms of human imagination. And uh, Revelation, uh, in my view, is very much like a, a cartoon fantasy in current genre. So verse 9, the great dragon. The ancient serpent, the one called devil and Satan, who deceives the whole inhabited world, he was thrown down into the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, remember I said that one entity in reality can be represented by many 
titles in Revelation. Here you have five related to the dragon. He's also the ancient serpent. He's the one called devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole inhabited world. So there's five titles for Satan in this one verse of Revelation. So the idea that uh, every symbol in Revelation must refer to something different uh, is not what the text itself uh, points to. There's an allusion here to Genesis 3 when it talks about the ancient serpent. And back there, you had the story of uh, the woman, Eve, and the serpent. And the serpent was telling lies about God. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. Verse 10 and 11. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come salvation and strength. The kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers, the one who accuses them before God day and night, has been cast down. Now, let me just go back a couple of slides. Do you notice that in verse 9, you have this war in heaven, verses 7 to 9, and Satan is thrown down to earth? Is that talking about? back in the beginning before creation? Or is that talking about something that happened in the context of the male child's ascension to heaven? In the story of chapter 12, the natural connection is with the time, uh, the first century, with the time of revelation, the time of the gospels, the time of Jesus. And uh, you note here, you have now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. All of that language is the language of enthronement. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he was enthroned to the acclamation of the heavenly audiences. Revelation 5 tells that story in great detail. So you have the enthronement of Christ. And what is connected with the enthronement of Christ? The accuser of our brothers, the one who accuses them before the throne of God day and night, has been cast down. So Revelation 12.10 locates this casting down of Satan to the time of Jesus' enthronement in heaven, which we would say A.D. 31. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. So here you have a reference to the cross. The enthronement and the cross of Christ is the primary uh, connection, the primary purpose of this vision of chapter 12. Yes, there are overtones of the earlier war, and, and you saw that the dragon, when he appears, before the child is born, the dragon is already dragged down a third of the stars of heaven. So there is reference to that earlier war. But here is the, this is the time of the enthronement of Christ in the context of the cross. And here, the accuser, the dragon, Satan, is cast down. Same language, the cast down as verse 9. So you have Christ who equals Michael and the male child. These are all linked together in the story. When was the casting down? The time of Jesus' ascension and enthronement. Now, if that sounds like heresy, take a look at John 12, where Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now, Will the ruler of this world be cast out? Who's the ruler of this world? Satan. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, the cross, will draw all people to myself. So Jesus identifies his ministry and his death and resurrection as the context in which Satan will be cast down. That's what Revelation 12 is reflecting. Uh, by this, I'm not rejecting you know, anything Adventists have said about the cosmic conflict uh, from Revelation 12, I'm simply pointing out the story isn't big enough, that there's more to Revelation 12 than, than what we sometimes uh, say about it. So, 
there's the cosmic conflict. So what about the 21st century? This is an apocalyptic era. Uh, younger generation saturated with apocalyptic themes. What can Revelation 12 say to this generation? What can Revelation 12 or should Revelation 12 say to the 21st century? Well, let's go back to Revelation 12 with that in mind and ask the question, what kind of war is this? You have war in heaven, a war way back in the beginning that is continued in the context of Jesus' ascension and, uh, and enthronement in heaven. What kind of war is this? Is it um, lightsabers, you know, like Star Wars? No, well, I don't know. How about arm wrestling? Yeah, probably not. What I would suggest is the war of Revelation 12 is a war of words. It's a war of words over the character and the government of God. Now, am I just making that up or is the text itself take us there? I'd suggest the text does. Let's go back to Revelation 12, 4. We have the tail of the dragon. Uh, this seems to be an allusion to Isaiah 9, 15. And uh, that's a whole nother story, how Revelation uses the Old Testament, but just take it on faith right now. It does this a lot. The elder and the honored man is the head. The prophet who teaches lies is the tail. So, this idea of the tail of the dragon dragging a third of the stars out of heaven. If stars represent angels, and they seem to do so uh, more often than, than not in Revelation, if stars represent angels, the tail of the dragon is how Satan persuaded a third of the angels to leave heaven with him when uh, he was cast down the first time. So uh, this tells us right away this isn't physical force that's involved at this point, but it's an issue of persuasion. Uh, verse nine, that ancient serpent clues us in that the Genesis three story is relevant to this war in heaven. It's telling lies about God. What God is like is the chief issue in the cosmic conflict. Is it the picture that Satan draws of God? Or is the picture that God seeks to demonstrate in Jesus Christ? Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters in verse 10. So this is a war about words. It's an echo of Job 1 and 2, when Satan is in heaven accusing Job. And, and God is defending Job. And then finally, verse 11. They overcame, military word, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So it's not a military battle, even though war language is used in verses 7 and 8, and uh, overcome is a military term, conquest, in verse 11. It's a war about testimony. It's a war about accusation. It's a war about truth and lies. So when we read Revelation 12 with that perspective in mind, I think it starts becoming very, very relevant to our topic for today. What are the weapons in that war? According to Revelation, on God's side, it's blood, it's word, it's self-sacrifice. In other words, these are emblems of God's character, a self-sacrificing, loving character on God's side. On Satan's side, the weapons in the war are intimidation, deception, accusation. There's a clear contrast of character. It's a war over the character of God. Is God the way Satan has made him out to be? Or is God the way he is portrayed in scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ? That's where the battle is. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and did not love their lives even unto death. 
the role that God's people can play in that cosmic conflict is a Job-like trust in God. To trust that the view of God's character that we see in Jesus Christ is the truth about God. And to trust in that God, no matter what happens. Job even said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That's the kind of trust that comes out of this. So, what is God like? According to scripture, the clearest revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ. I think the apex point of the New Testament may well be John 14, 9. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Anybody remember the context of that statement? It's in the upper room. Jesus with his disciples just before the cross. What did Jesus just do? Before serving the supper, he washed the disciples' feet. And in John 13, it says, verse 3, Jesus, knowing where he had come from, knowing where he was going, knowing who he was, bent down and began to wash the disciples' feet. The foot washing was a deliberate act to show what God is like, that he washed the feet of his denier, knowing that he would deny him, washed the feet of his betrayer, knowing that he would betray him. That is what God is like. And the shocking statement here, in the light of the foot washing, Jesus says, this act that totally blew you away when I, your teacher, did it. If the Father had come down and become human and walked among you, he'd have been no different than me. He'd have been just like me. The Father is just like Jesus. And it's fascinating, the New Testament, Jesus is often the recipient of quotations from the Old Testament of Yahweh. Texts that talk about Yahweh saying, there's no God beside me, are applied to Jesus in the New Testament. To me, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. In the New Testament, that's applied to Jesus. So Jesus is seen in the New Testament as the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And you could say from John 14 that the Father is the God of the New Testament. The big surprise is that the chief of it all is the way that Jesus lived here on this earth. This really, this insight was really important for me personally because I mentioned a closet there. When I was eight years old, there was a thunderstorm. This was living just outside New York City. And New York City has massive thunderstorms that, that come through every so often. And the lightning flashes and the thunder crashes, the ground shakes, the rain pours down, the wind, the house creaks, you know. And I was in my usual spot in thunderstorms on the floor of my bedroom closet. And, uh, and my mom popped into the room in the middle of this storm. And she was a good mom. Uh, she, uh, she did her best. Uh, she loved the Lord all of her life. But even the best of moms sometimes have a bad day. And I cried out from the floor there, Mom, why does it have to thunder and lightning like this? And as she was leaving the room, she tossed over her shoulder, God is angry with all those people who are breaking his commandments. Now, what does an eight-year-old boy know? He's broken a few commandments, right? So at that point, I was convinced that those thunderbolts were coming from me. And it took me decades, even as a pastor, it took me decades to fully get over that picture, that fear of God, not the good kind, you see that God was a, a punishing judge who would squash me like a bug the minute I 
I stepped out of line as a pastor or anything like that. Um, I sort of had a good cop, bad cop view of God. There was the Old Testament God, the bad cop, and there was the New Testament God, Jesus. That's not the picture of scripture. The picture of scripture is you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So, cosmic conflict, I believe it's all about character. Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. What is he accusing? It's about our character. It was about Job's character. Satan is accusing. This person is screwed up, God. You need to deal with this. You got to stop all this mercy stuff and get down to the business of being God. Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Now, in Revelation 12, what does that make God? Is God the encourager of the brothers and sisters? And I find it fascinating that Satan is portraying his own character as God's. That he portrays God as being accusatory toward us, judgmental, unforgiving, demanding. That's Satan's character. But he has convinced many of us that that, in fact, is what God is like. And the fascinating thing is that when we accuse our fellow brothers and sisters, when we are judgmental toward them, we are paying tribute to what we think God is like. We are portraying God in the person of Satan. Anyway, some implications here. I would suggest that there's no good cop, bad cop picture of God. In scripture, there is one God. Uh, scripture is confusing at times. We can talk about that. Uh, in the Old Testament particularly, it always it doesn't always give a clear picture of God because it's very much relating to people at that time. But when you look at the overall picture of scripture, with its high point in John 14, 9, Jesus came. The whole Gospel of John is about that. Jesus came to show us what God is really like. So the picture of Jesus three and a half years of ministry on this earth is what God would be like at all times if the universe were not in chaos and rebellion. I think there's some interesting implications for religion and politics. And I like to tease people and say, you know, God is at work in the Democratic Party. And a half of the room will say amen, and the other half starts hissing and booing, you know. And then I say, Satan is at work in the Democratic Party. God is at work in all political parties, and Satan is at work. That's what the cosmic conflict is all about. It's a universal conflict that's going on in our hearts, in our minds, in our political parties, in our countries, in our religions. God is at work within Islam. But Satan is also at work within Islam. The question we might ponder, is that also true of the Adventist church? And if it is, would we relate to it differently than we do? See, one of the key lessons of scripture, why this is so important, is you become like the God you worship. If you worship a God who is judgmental and severe and uh, is uh, arbitrary and uh, all the rest of that, you become more and more like that. And you can see that in many of our local churches. On the other hand, if the God that you worship is kind and gracious and forgiving, you become more and more like that. You become like the God you worship. So it's so important to get that piece right. Jesus is the clearest revelation of God. So his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection, that whole picture is where we truly understand what God is like. But here's the fascinating piece and the, the challenging one. We are the clearest picture of God some people will ever see. If we are judgmental and unkind 
and severe and arbitrary with other people. They will assume that since we say we follow God, that that's what God is actually like. In other words, we have influence. This brings the two pieces together, what my son was talking about, the character of God and the way people are treated in church. Those two go hand in glove. And uh, it's, it, it's critical. Uh, if any church wants to be successful in the 21st century, to have a clear picture of God and to learn to live by that, not by effort, but by focusing on that God. Uh, you become like the God you worship. So the behavior of professing Christians testifies more clearly to the character of God than anything else. So Joel's friends on the internet, where did they come up with this stuff? They learned it in church. And that's the tragedy. So how would we address youthful atheists if you should run into some? Where, where would you start? I think you have to start with an apology. Don't expect them to listen to you. If you start defending the church or defending the doctrine or, or doing a bunch of apologetics, Apologetics has its time and its place, but in someone who has been deeply hurt, someone who has been disappointed by God in their way of thinking, you don't start with apologetics. You start with an apology and saying, I, I, it's tragic that uh, this is the kind of picture you were subjected to. This is abusive behavior and it's inappropriate and I stand with you. So I Ty Gibson, a friend of mine, uh, whenever he runs into an atheist and his flights, uh, he's more talkative on planes than I am, but uh, he's run into a few and they'll say, I don't believe in God. And he says, oh, well, tell me, you know, what is it about God you don't believe in? And when they're done, he says, oh, I'm an atheist too, because I don't believe in that God either. Um, so when you do speak, speak as a believer slash scholar. What do I mean by that? As a believer, I believe there's enough evidence for me to make some serious commitments to be a Christian and to be a Seventh-day Adventist. As a believer, I have enough evidence to do that. As a scholar, I recognize that there's a lot yet to learn. I recognize that maybe not everything I believe is picture perfect. And so when we speak to someone else who's been disappointed by God and disappointed by the church, speak as one who is a believer, yes, but one who is also willing to challenge those beliefs and honestly listen. And, uh, and occasionally you might learn something from an atheist because an atheist is quick to see the flaws in the church that you or I might miss. And then to communicate at some point that God is not the way we have made him out to be. That God needs a second chance, just like they need a second chance. And I think the foot washing can be a story early on in such a relationship. Just say, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about God. I reject that totally. But let me tell you a story about God that may blow your mind. And tell the story of the foot washing and then how Jesus ends up closing the case by saying, that's what the father is like. That's what I came here to show. I think it's also helpful to communicate that the church, yes, even the Adventist church, is a battleground in the cosmic conflict. Everything is not perfect. And it never will be perfect in the ultimate sense. This is a battleground. Uh, church, perhaps, in, in a uh, spiritual sense, may one day find itself uh, in a different place. But as an institution, as something tangible, the church will always be a battleground, the cosmic conflict. And if we acknowledge that, it can put us on the same level as the person that we're talking to and enable them to perhaps open their mind and heart just a little bit to what we may think is, is important as well. And then Revelation 13 tells us that God is not surprised 
by the behavior of professing Christians and the failures of the church. He foresaw it all ahead of time. So, in conclusion, I would say wanted, dead or alive, and Adventism that is a little more like God. <laughs>